It's like what you put into your mind is the key. People let their mind control them. You got to control your mind because we all have problems, but how you handle it and look at it is the key. And that's really a five-star, gold-star, billion-dollar mind. You don't judge a book by the cover. The cover could be amazing, the book bad. The cover bad, the book amazing. One of the staples of what I do, I make it fun, but serious. People can love something if you're getting paid for it, because sometimes you just don't want to work harder, you got to work smarter. Anybody who's successful, they dealt with more problems and more failures than the people looking at them saying, how did they get successful? They don't understand the journey and all the failures. You have to want to change your routine. If you can change your routine, you're going to become a machine. The mind's never neutral. It's either for you or against you. Welcome to Success Story. I'm your host, Scott Clary. The Success Story podcast is brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network. HubSpot does a ton for entrepreneurs and business owners. That is why I'm so proud to partner with them for over three years now. If you need anything to build your business, help desk software, payment software, email marketing tools, CMS and blogging tools, SEO tools, deal management tracking, pipeline tracking. You don't need more tools to get more out of your business. You just need HubSpot. Their all-in-one customer platform is a dream come true for every member of your team. With best-in-class campaigns and workflows to generate more leads from marketing, category-leading pipeline management to help with sales, help them close more deals, powerful AI chatbots, and a knowledge Knowledge base to help your service team scale, and it is built to deliver results, to drive revenue faster, and to help you grow your business. So dump the disconnected tools and the chaos that comes with them. Discover what HubSpot's all-in-one platform can do to streamline your business. Visit HubSpot.com to grow better today. All right, Rick. I'm excited to do this. I'm really, really, I'm really grateful that you took a second to sit down. Um, I want to go through a lot, but the first question I want to start off with is what is a billion dollar mindset? Well, first off, great question, but I kind of got to back the truck up from that. Uh, the young lady that I wrote the book with, uh, Dr. Niva, I actually taught her and her sister back in the day. Okay. I got them both in the harbor. She was like number one player in the South. So she came and approached me about the book and bang, it's taken off. It's a bestseller and it's all about mental strength. It, it's really not a lot to do about tennis. It can apply to tennis, but it's about life, you know, mm -hmm. and the positivity and how to look at things through a different lens. You know, it's all about perspective. It's about choice. You know what I'm saying? And it's like what you put into your mind is the key. People let their mind control them. You got to control your mind. And that's confusing to a lot of people. And everybody's aware of what they put into their mouth, but they're not aware of what they put into their head. And the book is like about 80 hours of private lessons with Rick Macy. There's so much positivity in the thing, but it's all about mental strength and how you handle everything. Because we all have problems, but how you handle it and look at it is the key. And that's really a five-star, gold-star, you know, billion-dollar mine. And I'm curious, like, obviously, you know, people most know you as being a coach, but usually coaches start off as being players themselves, and then they graduate to coach at some point. So what was the point in your career when you understood the power of having this billion-dollar mind and this this idea that it wasn't just enough to be talented or skilled or learn the physical mechanics, but there was like a sports and just life psychology, but sports psychology component that you needed to master to take it to whatever the next level was. Yeah. Well, first off, Ed, that's a, another great question, you know, but I got to go back to truck up even further. You know, I grew up in a small town, Greenville, Ohio. I picked up a racket at age 12. Uh, my father passed away when I was 10. I picked up a racket at age 12. This is crazy stuff. At 18, I was the number one player in Ohio Valley with no lessons, okay? Very good in basketball, great athlete, okay? Um, very mentally strong, great competitor. So I've won on other qualities other than maybe 
optimal technique, whatever that is, you know, I was just like a baller and a gamer. So that's always been the cornerstone of how I was put together. I wanted the ball at the last, you know, the last second of the game. I always won on other qualities. I mean, I had some of the other things too, but that's the way I kind of was wired. And then later on in my career, well, early 80s, I teamed up with Dr. Jim Lair, who was the first of the Mohicans in sports psychology, all about mental toughness. It was more for the corporate structure. And I'm saying, wow, the way this guy presented it, I was kind of already like that, you know? So then when I really got into the teaching part, uh, that's been the staple because I'm more a life coach as much as a tennis coach. People might look at me with biomechanics or a motivator and all that, but no, that's like a, a huge part the way I'm put together. So I can look at it very differently. And I think when you're a coach and you understand every aspect and you're not pigeonholed and you realize the game is a game of inches from ear to ear, you know, and, and I know that. And, you know, I get people to believe and I get people to have confidence even even before they think of believing or even before they have confidence. I've done this for so long. So at the end of the day, it's a it's a game changer. And that's why I've had so many young kids become good kind of pretty quick. And I knew this was where this was going at an early age with a lot of these kids. But I try to get them to look at things to a different lens, how to flip it in their mind. Remember to forget, you know, I got to, I, I do this very differently than even a sports psychologist. And it's just one of the things on the cafeteria uh, when people work with myself. I love that. So obviously from like a super young age, you understood how important this was. And this must be what really differentiates people that are just good from great. I mean, there's so much to it, but I think the mindset probably unlocks a whole other level of performance. I mean, then, you know, you, you go into a lot of the actual mechanics as to why. But even if you look at the beginning, you know, of your coaching journey, you were, you know, I mean, the, you've coached tons of stars, but the, you know, Venus and Serena, they were, they were incredible, absolutely incredible. When you first started working with them, did you find that somebody who operates at that level had a little bit of the mindset already or is that still something that you had to teach them and that they really lacked they had the technical prowess they had the they had all the skill set but was the mindset the thing that you sort of imbued into them that was sort of like the secret sauce does that make sense absolutely no the, the Compton Comets they were like my own daughters as you probably saw in the movie you know King Richard uh Richard's like still one of my best friends you know so but I got to back up a little bit you know I had Capriati before them. And she's the best junior player ever to hold a racket in the history of the United States. Think about this. 12 years old, wins the National Girls 18s. Hard court and clay court as a 12-year-old. And we both know nowadays you can't do that. It's too physical. But even back then, you know, she took it on the rise and gave you a surprise. No one was like the generator. She was top 10 in the world at 14. So my blueprint for greatness was like no other. So now I go out to Compton, you know, I have no idea why I went, but it was the best vacation I ever took. Looking back, obviously, Richard guy wanted me to come out there said, Rick, I won't get you a shot. The funniest guy I've ever met. But when I got on the court with the two girls, they were nine and 10, I didn't see it. And I think it's a great lesson for any coach or parent. You don't judge a book by the cover. The cover could be amazing, the book bad. The cover bad, the book amazing. These girls had arms and hair and legs and beads were flying off their head. I'm going, what in God's name am I doing in Compton, California? They were like any kids that you and I coach that are just very good high-level juniors. Mm -hmm. But I'm getting to answer your question now. That was the first hour. We were drilling, doing all kinds of technical stuff. Then I said, let's play some competitive points. And it was me and Serena because Venus was much more mature. Serena was like still a little hamburger all over the plate. And the whole landscape changed. When I said game on and we kept score, the preparation got a little better. They were popping the popcorn, extra butter, the footwork improved, but here's the wild card. There was a rage. It freaked me out. I never freak out. It freaked me out. There was a rage 
inside these two little girls, I never saw in my life. They were running so hard to get the ball. Venus was almost 5'9". Her nose was out far off the ground. Sharina would try so hard to get the ball, she'd almost fall down. Wow. But that doesn't mean you're going to be a world champion. But it, whether it's a game of life or tennis, I knew they would be bulletproof and handle pressure. I knew right then and there, after that moment, I could put Humpty Dumpty together. I could help them the technical part and the, the any type of strategic part. But they were already bulletproof. I just saw that they could... They, listen, if you're all about the competition, you're going to handle pressure better with all, all this other nonsense. So that was one box that were, was checked. And then I started thinking six feet, 160, 5'10", 145, because Richard was pretty big. And I told Richard, come here. And this was in the movie. I said, let me tell you something. You got the next female Michael Jordan on your hands. And he puts you his arm that. around me and he goes, you knew that. no, brother, man. I got the next two. So, but to answer your question, it's what I saw on the inside. Then I saw speed, quickness, agility. But what I saw on the inside is why I rolled the cha- rolled the dice. I took a chance, you know, and as they say, the, the rest is history. I could have been wrong, but I thought they could transcend the sport. But it's all because of the inside. And I saw it in Kennan. I saw it in Sharapova. Okay. Roddick was a dog too, but you know, men's tennis is more physical. I got a couple girls here from Ukraine right now. They're all going to be top 10 in the world. It's because of the insight. I could put the other stuff together, but that, that mindset when you're all about the, and that doesn't mean you couldn't change. And that doesn't mean you can't get it later. But when you're all about the competition, pressure becomes one of your best friends. It's, it's amazing that you saw that. And I would actually ask you that mindset that hunger that can be a blessing but i would i would assume that if it's not channeled in the right way that could also destroy your career because you're going to injure something hurt yourself blow something up if you don't channel that energy and aggression in the right way like you have this art of taking that that passion and that and that aggression and putting it towards something useful but i see a lot of athletes burn out and and pull this and break that because they are so into it but then they don't know when to stop and they don't know when to take time off and they don't know when to recover so there's an art to this too it's not just all in and never take your foot off the gas no you're absolutely right there listen there's an art to this you know uh when to say it how to say it why to say it but once again one of the staples of what i do I make it fun, but serious, you know, and their kids first and tennis players second, you know, and there's an art to probing and how to say it, and depending on the age and whether I'm talking to an eight-year-old who's the best in the world or someone 23, 30 in the world on the WTA tour. It's a very different dynamic, the art of coaching. You just don't read a book and you figure this stuff out, you know, and the best compliment or one of the best compliments I ever got in my life was at the after party. Uh, after the red carpet with Venus and Serena, and they both said, Rick, we were literally brainwashed to become number one. The positivity I put around that, I tell everybody, I should be in the Hall of Fame for just putting up with Richard. Jesus, what was that all about, you know? But no, I got it because I was there for Venus and Serena. But they said that, you know, it was always about the future. It was always about, well, Hingis is going to get that. Navratrova would get that. Graf is going to get that. Capriotti would get that. And I'm talking to 11-year-olds. Now, you got to have the thoroughbred to maybe win the derby, but you got to have the thoroughbred that's mentally strong and the belief that was put in to, then you got all these boxes checked, big, strong, fast, quick, pretty high-level technique, great serves. So you get this package and greatness is a package. But like Serena, she would get mad a lot, but then she got more determined. McEnroe was kind of like that. Most Some people get mad and they disappear. They show their cards to their opponent. They can't re- regroup. You even see that on the tour, you know, breaking points, okay? And I don't clone people. It's not like the same person. Everybody, I, I teach everybody a little different, and I know how far it can go because I want someone with a backbone. 
I want someone with passion. I want someone with anger. But like you said, you got to control it because sometimes you just don't want to work harder. You got to work smarter. Amazing. And then I'm just very curious managing the dynamic because I mean, everybody has actually now seen, <laughs> seen the movie, seen, you know, the dynamic between uh, Richard and yourself and the girls as a coach. How do you manage a dynamic of somebody like Richard, who is obviously you're all focused on the girl's success. That's the end goal, but two very different personalities. And I know there was even a, a sort of like a, a breakup point where there was a letter written and I don't want to spend, cause everyone has seen the story and I, you know, judging by you recounting, a lot of it was quite accurate. I don't want to spend too much time on what people already know. But just from your perspective, how do you manage these really high tension relationships when everyone's a high performing individual? Well, no one, no one has been around the block in this area in the whole world than myself. Stefano Capriotti, Jim Pierce, Yuri Sharapova, you know, and Richard Williams. You know, you gotta understand they're it's usually daddy's little girl, doesn't happen a lot with the boys. Like Roddy's parents weren't even involved. You carry your own water. This is his thing. It's a different dynamic, you know, with the boys. But I think the first thing is you got to know when to keep your mouth shut. Some of the best coaching is not saying anything, you know, and feeling the temperature. I'm very good at reading people when to say this or when not to, where if you're so set in your ways, uh, this thing would have blown up in a week. And I knew it was going to be a challenge. Because even though Richard uh, was set in his ways, uh, he wasn't really a tennis coach, unreal father, one of the best ever. I mean, the girls brought their books to the court every day. And if it rained, he said, go up in Rick's office and study. And every single night, good, bad, happy, sad, uh, the girls would give me a hug and say, Rick, thank you very much. Listen, that's a world-class dad and mom. So, you know, it was a little different dynamic. but And that's why I had so much respect for him even though he might say some off the wall things and there's a lot of controversy. I made them legendary before they even did anything. A lot of media. I mean, it was out of control, but I think knowing when to keep your mouth shut. And I was there because I just love the girls. I was on a mission. I was rolling the dice. It's one thing people can love something if you're getting paid for it. Yeah. I was just like, you know, I was all in. Um, well, it, it was the opposite. Because you invest it. Opposite. It's one thing yeah. to say, hey, I think you're good. It's one thing to put out hundreds of thousands or a million dollars and, you know, go for the gusto. I could have been wrong, you know. So at the end of the day, I think just knowing when to take a deep breath, you don't react, you know, to anything. Uh, and when Richard wasn't there, that's when I would go in technically and do some reconstructive surgery, you know, because at the end of the day, they're going home eating bitter and you're not there at the table. So I think any coach that hears that, you know, you got to know how to handle this and not be set in your ways. And listen, because of the pedigree I got and everything I've done, eventually some of the parents, they start telling me what to do, how to hit a four. And I'm going, whoa, wait, wait, I wrote the curriculum for the USPTA. <laughs> it's like, I don't get into that. I just try to get better. And my favorite student, is really who's on the other side of the net, that hour, that minute, that second. I've always felt that way. And so I'm all about the players. I don't get into the other stuff, but it takes a strong mind uh, yeah. to be able to think like I think and handle the parents like that. Well, I would say, like, I think that, you know, just listening to how you how you manage all these relationships, you practice what you preach. So not only, not only, you know, it's one thing for the person performing to have the mindset and the billion dollar mind, right? But all the people that that person surrounds themselves with also has to have that billion dollar high performance mind. Because if not, then the support and the guidance that they're getting is not gonna be of quality. Like if you got emotional, it doesn't matter if you found a way to work with somebody who could be the next Michael Jordan or two of them, right? It only matters if you can properly serve them as a coach. And to do that, you got to be like, you know, eating your own dog food, so to speak, or else you're not going to be able to do it. Absolutely. Very good. I love it. Um, 
you know, just one final thought as, as sort of, as you look back, there was like a lot of, a lot of incredibly impressive moments when you were working with them. Um, when you look at sort of how you split and how you stopped working with them, was there any things that you wish you did different, any regrets on how you handled the relationship, anything at all? I'm just curious about that. And then let's move into a little bit more of the link between like mindset and performance and some of the things that you speak about in the book. Yeah. Well, no, first off, um, not, not really. I don't, I never look in the rear view mirror. I never look back. I'm trying to get better. If you're not getting better, you're getting worse. But regarding mm -hmm. that situation, it's a, it was a little complex, uh, because when it ended, you know, uh, Venus got, you know, the $12 million contract from Reebok. Okay. And no one helped put more zeros behind that deal than Rick Macy. You know what I mean? The helium in the balloon. Uh, and besides, she played that tournament. And she only played that tournament in Oakland because they changed the age eligibility rule. Or we, we wouldn't even have played that tournament. We kind of had to to beat the system to get in there so she wouldn't have someone dictating. And Richard agreed. He didn't want anybody dictating to him. So when she made that debut, I didn't know what was going to happen. I would know they see this tall, long girl that ran like the wind, okay, and they'd say she has enormous potential. And the fact she dropped Sean Stafford, 57 in the world, and almost beat number one, who she hadn't played a match in three and a half years, junior or anything, people go, whoa, whoa, this kid's going to be amazing. And her little sister, what Rick says, might even be better. So you got that as the backdrop. Eight months later, $12 million. We had an agreement. Uh, it didn't kind of go the way it should, but Richard offered me $1 million a year for the next five years, a million a year for five years to be exclusively with the girls, but I have to give up my business. And that kind of was like, whoa, because when you do something for, you know, four years and it's a crapshoot, okay, and there's a lot of things from the past, okay, and then the goalposts kind of change, even though there was a new opportunity, okay. I just felt like, whoa, you got to understand when I say four years, six hours a day or whatever, five days a week, four hours on Saturday, they were like lone daughters. You got to understand it doesn't sound like a lot, but every day there was like, this was up and down or whatever. And you know how Richard felt, you read the letter as you acknowledged. So uh, should I have done that deal? Uh, no, I, I never look back. You know, I don't, I just reload. And then after that, obviously, had a big hand with, you know, Mesquina and yeah. Sharapova and Kenan and many, many other people. And I run a business, you know, and it's a great model. So really, at the end of the day, no regrets. That's kind of how it ended. But what's interesting, how everything has come full circle and, you know, hundreds of millions of people kind of know really what I did. Where before, it might have been from Compton to center court. You know, and all, all Richard, you know what I mean? And, you know, as a coach, it, there's a, so much. I went into hitting partner, Taekwondo, boxing, ballet. I, you have no idea what went into this because um, I believe. So, yeah, no regrets. And here we are today. And uh, everybody's like, uh, uh, we've reunited. And we see it. And Shereen and I might be even doing this uh, docu-series, The Phenom Maker. So stay tuned. I love it. That. I love it. Good. Let's see it. I'm I'm excited for it. Um, all right. So let's teach let's teach some lessons here. So the book is talking about a link between mindset and achieving extraordinary success. So that's mental toughness. You're instilling mental toughness in athletes. How do you take some of those lessons that you instill in athletes and maybe translate them into other areas of life? So mental toughness in business, mental toughness in just day to day. What are like the, the core things that are not just, you know, tied back to athletics? Number one, everybody has to understand anybody who's successful, they dealt with more problems and more failures than the people looking at them saying, whoa, how did they get successful? But, but it's far, you just look at them as they're there. They don't understand the journey and all the failures and all the problems. Everybody has problems every day. You, me, everybody, how you deal with it, okay? 
that's such a big, big thing. It, that's the number one thing. It's the perspective of how you look at stuff. Okay, that's number one. And number two, everybody needs to be more appreciative of what they have instead of what they don't have. And that would be some of my best advice to anybody. You know, how to, you got to be more thankful and have more gratitude. But we get caught up in what we hear on the news and everything influences us. And we're on that merry-go-round and everybody needs to take a step back and, you know, uh, listen to YouTube, the motivational speakers, or write it down, all the positive stuff. And that's what's amazing about the book. You can use this as a roadmap or a blueprint the rest of your life and go back to it. It's like incredible. People have said it's changed their life if they want to change. Some people just like to be unhappy every day and complain. No problem. Good luck with that. You know, you get what you deserve. Everybody yeah. needs an attitude adjustment. So that would be the most important thing. Um right off the bat that that I would say regarding that. You know, people have to look at things differently because you look at something, I look at something, someone else, we see the same thing, but we react differently. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, it's so interesting. It's got to change your mindset. Well, yeah, I was going to say change so it If you want that. The one more are, thing. Okay. The, most oh, positive, no. wait, the most positive creatures on whom, okay, or the most successful, and vice versa. You're not, you're never going to find someone who's like amazingly successful on whatever level they're at, who's negative. You know, and success isn't always defined by money. You know, because everybody gets labeled. We're all human. We're all the same. We all make choices. You know, but I think if you appreciate and not get ahead of yourself and have a lot of humility and have a lot of pride in yourself. And never make excuses because the answer every day is just looking in the mirror. It's it's so important to realize that sometimes we get stuck in our own like negative thought patterns. It's interesting that you say that some people don't want to be happy because everyone's going to think, well, that's silly. Of course, I want to be happy. But I think we, we, we really sabotage like our own happiness more often than not. And... I would be curious if you have a way of breaking out of these negative thought patterns, because you're right. Some people do like the struggle and some people, and, and they're not even aware that they are constantly feeding behavior that creates this negativity in their life. How do you get out of that loop? Well, first off, you have to want to change your routine. If you can change your routine, then you're going to become a machine. You know, you got to want to change first. Now, some of the things that you can do, you need to have structure, okay? Not that you want to not have, you know, other things, wanna, but you got to have structure so you're not wasting time. You want to be around positive people. You want to be around smarter people than you. Okay, there's all these things. You know, people rather go home and sit on the couch and hear the next train wreck on TV. They just filter this negativity. And so, like you said, they get caught up into all that stuff. So nothing's better than that if you can put it in the right compartment, okay? So uh, I, I lead by example, you know, and so with, with all the kids, you know, every day I get up at 2 o'clock. I know that's crazy. For the last 25 years, I run a half mile. I open up the park every day at 5. I'm on the court at 6. I lead by example, okay? And so I got that. Uh, I show by example besides talking to the kids and the way I do things. But people have to want to change. You know, the, some people love to, to complain. They just love to gossip, okay? And here's old saying, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it, you know? But you got to change your environment, okay? You got to change your environment, the way you're looking at things and, and kind of what you're doing. But we do the exact same thing and we say, okay, well, there's a birthday that makes me happy or a graduation. Or thank God it's Friday. My motto is thank God it's every day. And not just because I'm, you know, 69. I don't, I've been that way. You got to appreciate every day. It's so hard. Everybody thinks their worst day is Monday. I never look at it like that. You know what I'm, or, oh, I'm glad it's Wednesday. It's the middle of the week. We get stereotyped with days. And it's hard to look at it like that. It's hard because we let our whole society affect us. And the ones that look forward to problems 
and they look forward to failure are the ones that keep going and said, oh, the world's coming to an end. Why me? Why is this happening to me? No, you got to look as an opportunity, you know, and plus all that other stuff, if nothing else, it's bad for your health. You know, you know, when you're, when you're just that, okay. Cause everybody, listen, we're all the same. We all can pick and choose. And choice is the is most powerful thing ever. Success Story is part of the HubSpot Podcast Network. In the network, there are other incredible podcasts like The Ops Authority, hosted by Natalie Gingrich. Every week on The Ops Authority, Natalie discovers actionable strategies to move your business forward and transformational stories of powerhouse business owners who value operations. You can't ignore back-end pieces that have to work together and flow smoothly in order to build a brand, grow a movement, or disrupt an industry. If the operations side of your business is a mess, putting out fires will always Always take priority, leaving no room for creative innovation, visibility, or networking with powerhouse peers or even wannabe powerhouse peers. You got to get your house in order. And to do that, you have to listen to The Ops Authority wherever you get your podcast. You, because I mean, like if you're dealing with, like, again, these are all lessons from people that are the highest performing people on earth. And when you lose, you can't let it set you back. It's like a learning opportunity, right? And when you compete at that level, I mean... For, for everyone else, we get constant tries at bat. We get constant, you know, opportunities to, we, we fail, we learn, we fail, we learn. Can you imagine what it's like when you fail at like a world-class athlete, world-class championship, Wimbledon, you know, uh, it could be Stanley Cup, it could be Super Bowl. Like there's not many chances to fail at that level. But if you do, you still can't let it ruin your whole career or else you'll never get back up again. And you got it the second you lose. Maybe you take a couple of days off, but then you're training for next season, training for next tournament. So you gotta, yeah. No, no one's going undefeated. It's not where you start, it's where you finish. Everybody has to understand that. You, when you understand, you're gonna make errors. You're gonna make mistakes. You're gonna fail. You're gonna have problems. You know, there's gonna be chaos, okay? Just don't create more for yourself. When you understand that's part of life, nothing's rainbow, lollipop, and sunshine. It's not like that. Okay, you can make it better, okay? Like people always say, like, Rick, why, why are you always so happy and positive? I, I don't get it. Why not? Okay, how I, because I have, I'm picking up tennis balls. I still sweep the sidewalk. I pick up garbage. Listen, I could go on and on. We all have the same stuff. How you deal with it. Okay. It's, it's all perspective. And I've kind of always been wired like that. And that's like been another gold nugget, you know, mm -hmm. in my back pocket, as far as giving all those life lessons and, and gems to people that I've taught along the way. But anybody can do that. It starts with a different mindset, the mental strength. You got to understand. We'll go, like you said, something like Michael Jordan, you know, he got cut from his basketball team as a salt. You understand? The best quarterbacks have probably thrown the most interceptions. The best home run hitters have struck out the most. A great baseball player hitter would bat like 333. You know what that means? Like he fails a lot. Okay. You got the best shooters in basketball have missed the most because they shot the most. But people don't look at it like that. You lose. I'm no good. I fail. No, it's an opportunity to plug in and find a better way. But you gotta look at it like that because you're gonna lose and you're gonna fail. No one's going undefeated, and especially with kids. And what I deal with, it's a junior development, not junior final destination. And I get kids to do things out of the box, and that's why I build a pro game, even at an eight, nine, 10 year old, if I have the thoroughbred with the work ethic and the genetic base, uh, to do adult things as kids. Because when they do adult things as kids, when they become adults, they do even bigger things. When you look at everyone who has talent, because a lot of people have talent, but only a few people really make it. So what's the difference between somebody who just has talent and somebody who has like the mindset or the, the secret sauce to become best in class, best in the world? First off, awesome question. Everybody has talent, some have more. It's what you do with the talent. Listen, there are people that could jump higher, run faster, shoot better than Jordan, but he's still the leader in the clubhouse. 
you know, Brady wasn't drafted until the sixth round in football. He's not the biggest, strongest, fastest, you know, bang, the mental strength, you know, the whole, the world's falling down on him. He didn't even realize he's having fun. Like he's probably eating popcorn on the couch with his kids and people are trying to do bodily harm to the guy. So listen, this is like, this is like the most important thing. What you, what you just said and people it's perspective. I know I keep saying that we can look at things, however we're going to look at it. And if, if I, if anybody can get anything out of this, look at things differently. You know, don't let things control you. You control things. When you um, when you look at like the crossover, I'm just very curious because as a tennis coach, you're, you're working with a neuroscientist to put this book together. What are some of the, as you're writing this book and as you're going back and forth, what are some of the things that you discovered even yourself that you may have not even realized as a tennis coach in terms of neuroscience, peak performance, maybe some of the, the biological or psychological underpinnings of what works and what doesn't. Was there anything that you even realized that you didn't realize before? Well, absolutely. First off, Dr. Niva, people don't realize that she's a wizard and she's one of the best in the world. I mean, this isn't just like, you know, a neurologist, something like this. This is prime time, you know, yeah. Hall of Fame type doctor. You got to understand. So she goes deep under the hood. And a lot of my beliefs and stuff, she just uh, acknowledged it from a medical point of view of how the brain works and receives and responds and kind of puts all these things together and how what we put into our mind is huge. You know what I'm saying? There's some people she works with, they have a month to live, you know what I mean? And they're the happiest people around, you know, wow. how she can get them to do stuff. And people uh, just hearing it from that point of view, from a scientific point of view, it just reaffirms everything I've done, you know, my whole career, how the mind controls the body. The mind's never neutral. It's either for you or against you, you know? And we, like you just said earlier, we sabotage ourselves. We, we get ourselves in this, but she just backs it up from a science point of view. And, uh, you know, it's all about the, the mental strength, um, so no, I, I learned so much, but she really reaffirmed uh, what I've been putting into, you know, whether it be kids, adults, any age, any level, uh, my whole career. What, you know, you just sort of touched on one thing. You spoke about like what you visualize in the mind and what goes into your mind. And I, like the concept of visualization is an interesting concept because a lot of uh, you know, success books and mindset books, they speak about visualization. And I'm curious if visualization has anything to do, anything significant to do with being a better athlete or winning the match or winning the game. Is there a piece of it that works well, or is this something that you don't subscribe to? No, this is, it's in my wheelhouse for sure. You know, there's an old saying, seeing is believing. You know, mm -hmm. if you've been there and done that, okay, already in your mind, it will bring tranquility and calmness and confidence. You know, I tell this, I tell this story all the time, and this isn't really visualization, and I'll, I'll get more to that in a second. You know, uh, Venus was playing in the, the semifinals, the U.S. Open. She ran 10 feet off the court. She's in a tiebreaker. She hits this backhand angle cross court from outer space, the most amazing angle ever. Then Sperlay a double false and Venus goes to the finals to play Hingis. And they ask her, how'd you hit that shot? You were like 10 feet off ice stadium. You hit an amazing angle uh, like no other. She goes, well, ever since I was a little kid, I was taught to run for a little ball. Uh, I was taught to run for every ball. So what that meant, she already was in that neighborhood back in the day, way off the court. And what I'm saying is if you've been there, done that, it's powerful. Now, regarding the picture part of it, um, creativity and imagination are the most powerful artists and writers and, you know, painters, you know, to have that creativity and they picture it, they see it in their mind. The reason why people don't do this and, you know, out front, they rather run and sweat and more repetitions, hit more balls. That's a part of it. You need repetition, but the practice in your mind takes discipline. And people don't have discipline. They think it's boring. It doesn't work. See yourself hitting the perfect forehand all the time or the perfect backhand 
or picture it in your mind. I tell people, this is the way I coach. You call up the line, you bounce it so many times, you take a deep breath, you picture it over there, see it going in there, add the crowd, add color. This is the way I teach and make it real, you know? And I make the kids at least have the discipline with me to visualize, okay? How many times have you or anybody out there say, oh, I play better after I watch a tennis match? Because that imprint is in their head, the moving, and they're not being judgmental and all that good stuff. So visualization is important. It's some, one of the most neglected things, I think, in sport. But I think at the highest level, the joker, who is the GOAT, by the way, you could go down the yellow brick road. All the best athletes, I guarantee, they don't maybe come out and say it. They visualize so much when they meditate, when they take a deep breath, they picture it. And the mind is strong. And one more story about that. There was a guy who played basketball and he broke both his arms. Okay. He visualized and couldn't shoot. Okay. He visualized every night 500 foul shots, uh, shooting foul shots. When he got the cast off and came back, okay, he shot better than when he had two regular arms. Wow. Now, I need everybody to understand that. I don't have his name and address right off the top of my head. That's a true story, but they're like that all the time. Navy SEALs, people in these situations that go in in this crazy environment, you know, to rescue people, fighter fires. You know, if me or you went into a fire, we'd be freaking out. They've already done mind control. They visualize besides the real thing. People don't understand how powerful that is. And it's probably not used enough in sports with juniors, okay, or even adults. Uh, you know, and then when you feel calm about the situation because you've been there, you're going to have a lot more confidence. You know what? I, I first of all, amazing that that you've seen it work so well, and it makes a lot of sense. And I'm wondering, if you have a thought on this? Because I'm just thinking about what is visualization doing? It's a, it's allowing you to first of all see that you can already do it, so you're it's almost like a confidence thing, and then it's like stopping your brain from self-sabotaging the action because I think so funny enough I'm, I'm not even going to pretend pretend to be anywhere close to <laughs> what you have have, uh, have coached and and done with your life but I used to play some tennis too however the only time I ever screwed up my serves is when I thought too much about the actual not visualized it but thought too much about what I was doing like almost overthought and over judged myself and got in my head and then I'm like then I jeopardize everything and I screw it up and then you actually like you hit the net you hit it out whatever you hit it wherever it's not supposed to go but I I always found that getting in my own head as opposed to being in some sort of flow state always screwed up the sport that I was playing I played I played soccer I played hockey I played tennis and it was always when I was in flow state and visualizing but not overly thinking the current action just visualizing the end result and focusing on that when I felt I operated and played the best. So it's like the body for some reason self-sabotages if you don't give it anything else to think about. And I don't know why that is, but that seems to be that seems to be what happened to me at least. I don't know if you see that. Absolutely. You know, the, the mental part of anything, I tell our body, the leader in the clubhouse, you got to remember to forget. Okay. That's the quote of the year. If you cannot forget. Now, when you talk about tennis, you got 20 seconds to flip it in your mind that it happened 20 years ago. And that's a, you look at, you look at Nadal, Federer, Joe, you look at anybody at the highest level or anybody you see on TV, they can do this. But if you went to a junior tournament, you could probably walk around and go, they're winning, they're losing, they're winning. They're, you would know just by looking without even looking at the scorecard. Okay, you can see how they let everything control them, where at the highest level, it never even happened failure or they hit it in the net or they miss three serves they're not going they're not analyzing it okay that's not visualization but that's the mental strength of forgetting it's mind control these guys are wizards at the top okay and no one has done it better uh than the joker okay this guy's unreal even when the crowd boos him he's trained himself i want you to boo me mm. think about that now that's really deep that's the ultimate everybody wants to be loved He'll, he's wants them to boo him because he knows they might, and he'll flip it, and he'll not only beat the guy on the other side, 
go beat everybody booing him also. Now that's at a whole nother level, but it's the same thing in the game of life. You know what I'm saying? Uh, now yeah. uh, you're going to just back to perspective and understanding this is part of the deal. And this is what nobody does in the game of life. Okay. Nobody, you know, and you got, like I said, appreciate what you have, not what you don't have. Problems are going to happen. You should start re responding to every problem, respond to it, but in a positive way. Some people yell, some people will scream. Some people are still mad about things that happened 20 years ago. It's crazy. You know, they can't let it go. Time heals all, but with some, they they like to be like that. So you get what you deserve, I guess. You know, you mentioned something about when you're working with juniors, you're helping them operate and play like adults. So you're obviously giving them stretch goals and you're putting them in like these slightly stretched environments where they're pushing themselves to perform slightly, you know, in a more aggressive way or a more difficult way than they normally would. And you keep like upskilling them that way. How do you find that balance between stretching somebody so that they upskill versus basically completely demoralizing them because they can't compete at the level that you're asking them to compete at? Awesome question. Anybody listening to this, there is a fine line between courage and stupidity. Okay. Sometimes you might need both. You got to know who you're dealing with. Um, and I deal with all kinds of levels. Okay. Some of the best kids in the world. Okay. Uh, and I do have a couple that are the best in the world. And it's all about positive errors, pulling the trigger. You know what I mean? Getting out of your comfort zone to go in the end zone. But then again, okay, knowing when to reset. I'm always about the future because you got to understand a few more inches, a few more pounds, they would have got there and been set. You know, people miss because they're immature or they miss because they're little. They got little arms or legs, you know. I had a girl yesterday, she came to the net like 16 times. You know, she's 12 years old. Who She actually just beat a girl who was 150 in the world on the WTA tour five years ago. She's 12 wow. years old. She's in the final of the Battle of Boca right now, and I should be watching, but I told her I had a podcast. So at the <laughs> end of the day, she still had success, and she came to the net 16 times. Because when someday she plays Sabalika, uh, she's going to, when she's up there, I want her comfortable. you got to get uncomfortable to get comfortable. Now, if it's a level where they can't keep the ball in play, okay, you got to then teach them differently to slow down, keep it in play. But listen, it's a quality of the consistency at the highest level. Number 1,000 could rally back and forth and look just like Djokovic or like uh, Iga. But when they play, it's like, see a leader alligator. You know, we know who would win those matches. So it's not like that. But you got to be, that's the art of coaching. You know, there's a fine line between courage and stupidity. But listen, when you get kids to do stuff and then they prove it to themselves, not out of the basket, that's vanilla or hand feeding or in a practice match, that's the next step. But when they can do it in combat, in competition, then they get the big C. And while people get confidence, you know, as well as I do, they can do anything, you know, because they always do better in practice. You know, they do better when you hand feed or yeah. you scale it down. You need to do it when it's 40-30. And that's why I create situations and I try to get them to be uncomfortable and I put pressure on them. Uh, and some parents don't get it. They say, oh, why are you doing that to my kid? I said, I want him to get better. It's the real world, you know? Like what I love, one more thing about Richard Williams, he would go, uh, Rick, can you get VW, Venus? Uh, I want her to play someone who cheats a lot, okay? And I go, <laughs> Well, we got a lot of those here, so take your pick, you know? So, no, he wanted he wanted that. And he goes, you can even tell the guy when it hits the line, call it out. And he'd park his 57 Chevy next to court, turn the radio up. She'd be serving. You know, it's crazy. And most parents would think you're picking on my kid. He made those girls rough and tough, but he was a great father and loved them like no other, okay? It was like this and that. And as as quirky or maybe he did some things that were out of the box uh you can't argue with the success no and and like listen if you want to be the best in the world you got to deal with every every situation every circumstance you cheaters liars distractions it's all real life it's it's just real life you can't you can't avoid it no, but a lot um, of people yeah no i you know a lot of people 
They don't want to play with other people because maybe they're younger and better. And you get into all these situations. Yeah. And then if they don't like it, they go down the block to the next person. You know, anybody, anytime, anywhere, you know, a winner finds a way at the end of the day. And that's the way people should look at the game of life. Because if you're not getting better every day, and that's what people should do. Did I get better today? At whatever you're doing, if you're not getting better, you got worse. Just another thought on confidence, because, you know, you said confidence. If you get that big C, then you can do anything. But when you start to, when you start to work with the best people in the world, talk to me about balancing ego versus confidence. How can ego sideline a great athlete, a great player, once they had confidence and they won a couple times? Have you seen that happen too? Absolutely. Confidence, unfortunately, is a fleeting thing. You know, you see these spurts, like someone's on a roll, you know, like you got Rubla. He lost four times in a row before this tournament, then he wins the tournament. You know, you think he's going the other way and he wins the tournament. If people do this and then they disappear. There's a fine line, especially in tennis. You take it a little earlier, you move a little quicker, you have a little more confidence going after shots. Confidence is huge. And that's why you need this support system around you to remember all the good things you do and how good you are. Because like you said, you self-sabotage yourself and I lost, I'm not playing good. And then you get self-doubt and it's, it's an effects of footwork, a few milliseconds. That's the difference between winning and losing. Take pulling up, taking it up the line where you're staying in the cross court maybe too long or you just are more adventurous, like you just own it. You know what I'm saying? So confidence is, to me, the most important thing uh, ever. And it's hard to keep the belief. Obviously, if you got high-level biomechanic, it's much easier if you have that. It's going to hold up more under pressure. But listen, it's not a beauty contest. It's not who has the best forehand, backhand serve. I tell the kids all the time, listen, have, how many of you lost to people and they had a better forehand, backhand, and serve? You know, it's this feet and you did. You had a better backhand, forehand, and serve. They run, they fight, they sweat, they shut up. They're like a dog. You know, they just bab because they forget they're so in the moment. And that's what, that's the wild card and all these people at the top. Okay. You got to understand that's already there. And that's what I saw it earlier about Venus and Serena. Brutal. Roddy had that. This guy was like a mosquito, man. This guy wouldn't leave you alone. He has thirst for competition was unreal. I knew he'd be one of the best in the world. I didn't know he'd win the U.S. Open at age 20 or whatever, but Andy was an incredible competitor even at a young age. And so that's going to help you in the game of life that you don't take no for an answer. You know you're going to get knocked down and you try harder instead of feeling sorry for yourself. But confidence is huge, okay? It's it's a huge thing, but it can go like that. But that's why when you have people around you, um, like today, the little girl came up to me. I said, listen, you're the best player in the world at age 12. I said, you can beat this girl if you play good. Here's the plan. I want you to have the best day of your life. I want you to have fun and smile and just let it fly. Because once you show, once the school sees how good you are, she's going to get nervous. Okay. And uh, Sophia actually won the match. Now she's in the finals. You know, she never beat someone this good. Okay. Uh, instead of thinking this girl's better or what she, you know, I, her mind was so far away from that. It was about her. It's all about you. Know what the other ones bring into the table but it's always about you. You know, when you think back at, at how you trained uh, Venus and Serena and even like how your coaching approach has evolved, and obviously it's silly to say that you would do too much differently because you see where they've ended up and obviously they've had an incredible career. But is there anything that you wish that you had taught them differently or, or trained them differently based on how you've evolved as a coach? Uh, well, first off, biomechanically, because of my partnership with Dr. Brian Gordon, he is an expert in biomechanics. He did his thesis on this stuff. We partnered like 15 years ago. As you probably know, cutting edge, you know, we're way ahead of the curve. Still are with biomechanics, okay? I think any coach wants to get better. You need to have a better understanding of that, not just throw the word around because there's principles that have to be applied. Like I saw, there was a big change in Sabalinka's serve. The guy that worked with her did an amazing job. There were some flaws there, and he put Humpty Dumpty together. But, yeah, I wish I would have technically been even better back then. I wanted Venus to do a few things differently, but her contact didn't deviate on her backhand. 
you know, she dropped the racket and stuff like that, but not really, you know, not really, because I would motivate more and work more on uh, their strategic part, you know, and as you evolve, like I said, you want to keep getting better. Most, like some people would like, my experience with being a Serena, they played no junior tournaments. So does that mean Rick Macy says, here's the blueprint, go and play junior tournaments. You know, but yeah. Venus and Serena, Obviously. they were so competitive. If there was a piece of bread on the table, they would fight for it. They were so competitive. So they didn't need it like people need to know how to win and people need to know how to lose. You know, that's part of the journey as being a, a an athlete in junior tennis. So, no, I, I, I don't really, I don't look back, uh, but I had a lot of mental training with Dr. Jim Lair and the way I was brought up. And that was the cornerstone. You learn the knowledge as you go along. And even today, I learn more from the students every single day. And if anybody could say, hey, I've been there, done that, over 300 national championships and all the kids have got the number one or everything that you know, I've been fortunate to achieve, I don't look at it like that at all. I just, I'm, I'm getting better every day. So when, if you could look at it like that, and this should help most coaches, you know, but it's easy to say, hey, look what I've done and you know it all. No, you don't. When you think you know it all, you know nothing. Yeah. Amen. What's the, what, when you look at all the junior athletes that come in, you spoke about so many different things here today that are just mission critical for being successful, for performing at such a high level. What do you think people have the most trouble with? You mean the athlete? The athletes, yeah, athlete. What is the concept that they have trouble wrapping their head around? Oh, no, it's a, it's the mental part. Listen, the, to teach someone an ATP forehand or ATP backhand, or, or like I put some of the best serves together in the history of tennis, and even people who just went to college. People, you know, even Opelka when he was 12, he'll say, hey, Rick, I remember you telling me, step on the bug because he wasn't using the ground correctly. Yeah. He'll even come up to me, hey, Rick, step on, step on the bug. So to me, that's the easier part. And how to play the game is the easier part. But how to deal with stuff, because people can't let things go. When you, okay, I tell people all the time, if you hit a ball into the net against Alcarez, okay, would you feel any different if you hit it into the net playing a 10-year-old? And 50 kids will say, yes. I said, well, you hit it into the net. You same, see, same thing. It's, all, it's all the mindset. Do you think Djokovic thinks any different if he hits in the net against Federer Okay, or a college player. No. It doesn't think like that. It's mind control. But kids, their brain's not developed. You can get that later on. Their brain can't develop. Some people get it sooner rather than later. I mean, Sharapova, she was in a bubble when I had her at age 11. A lot of shortcomings athletically. But mentally, I said, this little girl will be number one in the world. If she checked enough boxes mentally, same with Kenan, the scariest little creature I ever taught. Even though I have a new one that's scarier than her, who's eight, named Vlada. So at the end of the day, that's the mental part. And when you're when you have all that going on, you freak out. You get nervous. You know that. If you're not relaxed and having fun and, and just enjoying the battle, that's why I said that about BW and Serena. They were all about the competition. Everybody gets nervous. Everybody chokes. Greatness is never afraid. Everybody gets nervous and everybody's going to choke, but greatness doesn't as much. They can stay near the ideal performance state where they're really calm, but very intense. You know, they don't deviate too far off where you got other people, great athlete, Monfils, how many grand slam, Cheerios, great athlete. And, and I'm not knocking them. They're amazing. But you see what I'm saying? And yeah. it's at the level we're talking about, you know, the big three and these guys, that's rare air. People just take it for granted, you know, Sampras and guys like that. But it's the mental part for everybody. And, you know, to have a great attitude, people say, well, I have a great attitude when I'm winning. It's backwards. <laughs> you, the one thing you got control over, maybe besides your ball toss, is your attitude. Is your attitude. Even though you're getting your brains beat out, could you be having fun? And most of them say no. Yes, it's about the competition. You know, and it's a, it's perspective. And this is what I do, and I can probably present it and explain it. Uh, 
better than probably any sports psychologist because I'm right there. I know how to how to do this and get into the kid's head. And it not only can transform their game, but it transforms their life. They treat people better. They, I don't know, they clean their room better and they get better grades in school. They have a better work ethic. They come back and they said, Rick, I pass that down to, to my kid. Even Christian Rude, who I taught him, Casper's dad, okay, Norway's finest, until his son took his place. He said, Casper lives by a winner finds a way, a loser makes an excuse. I learned that from my dad, who was trained by Rick Macy, you know, and that's the best feeling in the world. Is He never said I helped his backhand. It was all about his mind. And to me, that's when you're changing people's lives. I don't change strokes. I change people's, like, mind. I love it. If if people want to connect with you, like I mean, like right now, I didn't even realize this. You're up in Boca, so you're still you're still working. You're, you're not you're not you're not taking time off yet. You're still working, so you have everything going off. Yeah. No, listen. I teach seven days a week, fifty hours. I teach more privates than anybody in the United States. Okay. Uh, if people email, I email email them back. My phone number is out there. I'm on Court One. If you ever want to stop by. Uh, we have like 80 tournaments a year. We have a $10,000 prize money tournament every weekend. The Battle of Boca, anywhere from 120 to 200 players. Three years ago, Shelton played it. Okay, probably eight people played it that played the U.S. Open this year. UTR from age five, all the, I mean, from UTR five to 14. Okay, crazy. The level, and we have about 25 to 30, $25,000 UTR tournaments that stream live on Amazon. So those are going on there. So we have a lot of activity all the time. Uh, Coco Golf just did a commercial there a month ago with UPS. Pros come out and practice, and you can rent a court for $5. It's a public park, Rick Macy Tennis Center. It looks like Disneyland and Candyland. Motivational signs everywhere. And then we have the academy, all ages, all levels. Um, so it's South County Regional Park, and it's a it's a public park like no other. But, yeah, so we'll uh, – well, we'll definitely do this again. Well, I'm, I'm coming up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come play. I'm gonna dust off my racket. But uh, no, that's amazing. Uh, Billion Dollar Mind: Practical Guide to the Game of Life. So you can get that literally wherever you get your books. Um, Amazon. Uh, you can probably. Is it? Do you have a website as well that you want to send people to or social? Yeah, you can get you can get Billion Dollar Mind on Amazon.com. Uh, if you want to go to the website www.rickmacy.com. I got the number one selling videos, instructional stuff in, in the country, uh, Netflix, plus I, there's some biomechanical stuff on there, Instagram. There, I got a lot of content on YouTube. I do like 30 to a, uh, a minute tip, free content for everybody, especially at this stage of, guy, of the game. I just like helping anybody and, you know, people really, uh, they really like it. They like it even more when it's free, okay, but that's okay with me. Um, <laughs> You know, I just like I just like helping people and coaches can even come and get certified. I've certified probably over two thousand coaches, twenty five hundred, I think. Uh, they come in, they get on the court with me, whether it's a day, two day, three or four, they're blown away. Like we said earlier, you don't read a book and become a great coach. That can help you have in your toolbox. They freak out because you know I have like a ten year old, a twelve year old. Yeah, a uh, uh, an eighty year old guy who's number one in the country. Believe it or not, I have a pro player. Then this, then the dynamics with the parents and the number one kid in Europe, and they see this how it's done: the mental, the technical, the biomechanic, the interaction, the good, the bad, the ugly. How to communicate, why to say it, when to say it, how to say it. It's and uh, the parents are involved. You know, mm -hmm. they pick up the balls. I let the parents involved. You know, because. I learned long ago they're going to be involved anyway. So I just, hey, have them pick the balls up at least. But no, you got to let them involve. But that's the way it's worked for me. Maybe not for everybody. Um, and if anybody ever wants to come out and just kind of watch and see what goes on, because uh, all the coaches are trained in the methodology, because we do have the number one teaching system technically in the world. And it's all been spearheaded by uh, my partner, Dr. Brian Gordon, who's like a true genius in biomechanics. Amazing. Okay. I'll put a whole bunch of links for everything, book, uh, your website, um, links to the tennis club, uh, everything in the show notes so people can go check it out. Obviously, if you're in, in South Florida, um, go up and say hi. I want to just, you know, tee this up, 
with one last thought. You know, you've had an incredible career, worked with some of the most notable athletes of our time. If you could go back and tell yourself, tell your 20 year old self one lesson, one idea, one learning, what would that thing be? Wait, say that one more time. One learning, what would one lesson for a 20 for your 20 year old self? What would that thing be that you would tell yourself? Or a lesson to me? Yeah, to you. Or... To you. <laughs> to you. That's no one's asked me that. Um, why well, I said many times I never look back, but at 20, I knew I loved helping others more than helping myself. Yeah. And I love to analyze things, you know, and I love, uh, I've always had the passion to, to get better. Um, I don't really, I don't have any regrets. You know, I, I really can't even answer that. I, I wouldn't. I no, wouldn't it's good. Do, That's the way to live life. That's the way to yeah, live. Yeah, I don't, I don't have any regrets. I've been blessed. I've been fortunate. Like I said, you know, I grew up, me and my mom and my sister are a small town, you know, and, uh, um, you know, it might be easier if someone wins Wimbledon. And I'm really the last of the Mohicans. I started this in 1985. And I have a very different model because the engine, I'm involved. You know, I taught probably 2,500 hours last year of private lesson. That's crazy. You know what I'm saying? I, I do something very different. We have 12 coaches, great fitness. We don't do boarding. It's not a glorified boarding school. But well, we get the best talent. We put Humpty Dumpty together. So I don't, I don't have any uh, regrets. I just feel I've been blessed and fortunate. And I looked at, I look at it that way every single day. Uh, and I love it just as much now as I did back then, even if I didn't have to do this now, I can't wait to, uh, check my phone to see how the girl did. And then when I wake up tomorrow, I can't wait to get back to work.